Hi there. I'm Chief Justice Warren of the Supreme Court, and I'm calling you to say congratulations. You've been personally selected by Mr. President Lyndon B. Johnson himself to join my new mystery squad. It's called the Warren Squad of Super Smart Sleuths for Seeing Who Assassinated Somebody. We're going to solve the really important mystery of who killed the old president, Mr. John F. Kennedy. Am I speaking with a Mr. Alan Dulles? Yes, you are. Oh, okay, sorry. I know about all the main guys, like Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Johnson and stuff, but I'm not too familiar with you, to be honest, so let's get to know Alan. Did you know the old president at all? Oh, I knew him. He was actually my boss until two years ago this very day. That little Kennedy, he thought he was God. Oh, wow! Sounds like you guys were close. So what happened in 1961? The darkest day of my life. The day that sniveling whelp fired me. Golly! What was the reason for the firing? Oh, the pretty boy fired me because I took my job too seriously and was trying too hard to get things done. Yes, yes, that's why I got fired. Well, that doesn't seem fair. You were just doing your job. And what was your job, anyway? My job? Uh, killing presidents. Your job was killing presidents. Don't worry. Only the ones who got in my way. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh my god, it makes perfect sense! Mr. Johnson put you on my mystery squad because you knew Kennedy and you're an expert at this kind of stuff. You know, for me, president assassination is scary and intimidating, but for you, it's just a regular Tuesday at the office. Well, I wouldn't say that. It was a Friday. Stuff like this, you gotta plan for the end of the week. What? Nothing. Thank you for the call. I'm glad to be included in this cover-up. I mean, this commission. Yes, I'll be there. Farewell, Justice Warren. Okay, goodbye, Mr. Allen Dulles, sir. Excited to work with you. Fools the fools. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dulles? Oh, you're still there? What were you laughing about? Nothing. I was just remembering a family circus cartoon I saw where Jeffy calls shorts his short sleeve pants. <laughs> oh, that's very good. That's good, sir. Do you mind if I steal that? Oh, it's not my joke. Go ahead. <laughs> it's very funny. Anyways, goodbye for real this time. Goodbye. <laughs> The murder most foul of JFK has become very likely the most investigated crime in human history. There have been multiple official government investigations, as well as countless studies by journalists, housewives, sovereign citizens, and other interested parties from all around the world. Now, we're going to get into it, but first, I got to do a little spiel like a please ensure your seatbelt clicks into place before we take a ride on Six Flags famous Terror at Dealey Plaza Oliver Stone's JFK tie-in roller coaster. First, I'm going to be talking about a tragic and gruesome death and making some jokes that many might consider to be in poor taste. Personally, I feel like enough time has passed that we can clown around about a murdered president a little bit. Is that punching down? On the one hand, he was killed, but on the other hand, he was president, right? One thing I won't be doing at any point is showing photos of dead bodies or footage of anyone getting murdered. If you have a really urgent need to see these things, I promise if you just head over to Google, you will be able to find a therapist. Now, we've got a lot of names and events and concepts to go over here. Look, I know the bulletin board and red string idea is cliche, basically shorthand for unhinged conspiracy theorist at this point, but like... It's also probably the best way to display all the information. There's a reason that's a cliche. There's so many people in evidence, and it's all connected. It's all connected, don't you see? You will, once I show you my conspiracy board. But don't worry, it's going to be easy to follow. No bulletin board background. I've got these nice, 
washed out pastel color fields here. Uh, no red string connectors. I'll be using these teal arrows. I like teal. Solid line for a confirmed connection. Dashed line when I'm speculating when somebody gets killed. That's notated with an arrow crossed with an X. Funding gets notated by dollar signs along an arrow. Uh, lovers have hearts on their connection line and relatives have two lines. As for the people, uh, we've got different groups here. There's six basic groups I'm going to color code so we can tell at a glance who we're dealing with. Unaffiliated civilians are yellow. U.S. politicians are orange. Communists are red. The wealthy power elite are green. Mafia are purple. And the alphabet boys are blue. That's CIA and FBI. Some people fall into more than one category, so they'll have multiple colors. And you'll notice there's some other recurring themes with this cast of characters, so I'll use this ketchup splotch when people die mysteriously, this cyclops triangle when someone admits to being involved in a conspiracy, and this plane and baby for people with an airport named after their brother. If you've been watching Chill Globum for a while now, you'll know I have a stylized way of depicting people at the CIA. No, it's not a ripoff of Stewie from Family Guy, as many have commented. This is my own original design. Now, while this usually works when I'm discussing the CIA as a monolithic organization, I want to make sure people can tell this sprawling cast of characters apart, and there's a lot of CIA people involved here, so I've come up with several more unique, original chill goblin trademark character designs all right i'm excited i put some love into this i think it's gonna be nice this ain't your grandpa's conspiracy board uh, by the way in all seriousness you should check in on your grandpa he's been spending a lot of time with that conspiracy board maybe unsubscribe from a few channels on his youtube take his red string away all right spiel's over it's time to get into it let's start out with the least controversial facts and then as we zoom out we'll get into the swarm of secondary characters with often dubious connections First, there are three central characters that I think most of us agree are definitely involved in this story in some way. First, there's President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the youngest president, the first Catholic president, and easily top five most handsome presidents. JFK grew up unfathomably wealthy, the equivalent to the modern son of a billionaire. Uh, JFK ran against Richard Nixon, who was by far the favorite to win and somehow was able to narrowly beat him. There were many reasons JFK was able to surprise everyone with a victory, including his father's wealth and connections, but it's hard not to credit JFK's undeniable charisma, wit, and overall handsomeness. Just look at the two of them on the debate stage. It looks like a live-action Virgin vs. Chad meme. Uh, this was a huge factor in Nixon's defeat and prevented him from ever getting higher than sixth most handsome president. After winning the election, JFK was sworn in. He used his powerful position as a leader of the free world to give inspiring speeches, pursue an aggressive space program, and to have a lot of sex. Just so much sex. My God, really bad sex from the sounds of it. There are a few corroborating reports of just how quickly it would be over. Anyway, I'm getting distracted here. This all ended November 22nd, 1963, when, during a presidential motorcade through Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas, for one reason or another, JFK abruptly went from being the most powerful man in the world to being just as powerful as any old random dead guy. That's my way of saying he died. All right. Second, there's the man who was arrested for killing Kennedy, Lee Harvey Oswald. Oswald grew up poor, had a difficult time making friends. A contrarian by nature, Oswald became fascinated by the works of Karl Marx and went around Cold War America telling everyone he was a communist. Occasionally, you'll be surprised to hear, getting beaten up for it. He stopped being just like me for real when he joined the U.S. Marines, where his communist views, which he still espoused, earned him the nickname Oswaldkovich. He then defected from the army and went to live in the USSR, telling Soviet authorities that he'd give them secret information he'd learned from being a Marine. His information seems to have been completely useless to them, as one KGB agent who interviewed him said, He gave such outdated information, the kind we say the sparrows have already chirped to the entire world, not the kind of information that would interest such a high-level organization like ours. In solidarity with Ukraine, I will be refusing to learn how to do a good Russian accent. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, good at, I'm not good at accents. I don't know why I do them so much. 
Oswald stayed in the USSR for a while, marrying a Russian woman, Marina Oswald, and then returned to the United States in June of 1962. In October of 1963, Oswald got a job at the Texas School Book Depository, which happens to overlook Dealey Plaza and the exact spot on the road Kennedy was shot. Oswald was arrested just hours after the shooting, and the entire time he was in Dallas police custody, he denied having any part in it, saying over and over, I'm a patsy. Just two days later, as Dallas police paraded Oswald in front of live television cameras, Lee Harvey Oswald was himself shot and killed by the third guy I want to talk about, Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby was a Dallas business owner who'd managed various strip clubs, dance halls, and nightclubs. His clubs catered to the Dallas police, who he would provide with free drinks, sex workers, and other favors. From childhood, he was known for having a temper and being quick to violence. And as an adult, he worked as the bouncer in his own establishment, often beating both his customers and his employees, typically ending these beatdowns by throwing people down the club stairs. You know what they say, do what you love, and you'll kill the guy who killed the president. Despite the surefire appeal of a club where you could get your ass kicked by the owner, Ruby was struggling financially in a huge amount of debt to the IRS. When Kennedy was assassinated, Ruby was running the Carousel Club at 1312 Commerce Street in downtown Dallas, which is a pretty funny address for a club frequented by cops. Mere hours after the assassination, Ruby showed up in the Dallas police headquarters to just hang out. I guess when you give cops enough free drinks, you just get to join the presidential assassin investigation entourage. Two days later, Oswald was brought out in front of these live TV cameras where Ruby shot and killed him. Dallas police instantly recognized Ruby and he was arrested. He became very ill in prison and died of cancer four years later in 1967, oddly enough, in the same hospital that both Lee Harvey Oswald and President Kennedy had been taken to four years earlier. So. Before we go any further, can we acknowledge that this is already pretty weird? President Kennedy, a rich, handsome, popular, and powerful man, gets gunned down by some unconnected loser. Then, before that loser can be investigated, this other, even bigger loser shows up and guns him down. You don't need to be a conspiracy theorist to look at all this and say, that is weird. That is two losers involved in two interconnected, high-profile assassinations in a very short window of time. It's weird. It's weird is what it is. Stop right there. Now this is a pitfall of conspiratorial thinking. Coincidences are actually a normal part of life, and when people start looking at any coincidence as hard proof of foul play, that is how they get Q-pilled. One of the catchphrases of image board conspiracy guru Q is, nothing is a coincidence, and this way of thinking can lead to some very dark places. So the fact that two related assassinations occurred in the same weekend is definitely weird but it could very possibly be a stroke of bad luck. It's also not that weird that someone would want to kill Oswald. There are only so many hospitals in Dallas. Coincidences happen all the time, and they're almost never the result of plans by powerful shadowy figures. Sometimes you just start noticing the number 23 everywhere, and that's fine. It probably doesn't mean that you're receiving messages from a dog star Sirius. As we explore different possible explanations for the JFK assassination, Spoiler alert here, there's going to be a lot more weird stuff. So keep in mind that the plural of coincidence isn't evidence. At the same time, this ain't flat earth shit. This ain't ancient alien theories. We aren't dealing with shape-shifting reptilian overlord Illuminati conjecture this time. This is the JFK assassination, and the conspiracy theories surrounding it have a little bit more meat to them. Now, whatever you believe happened in Dallas that fateful day... Once you look into it, I think you'll agree there are several things that are extremely sus. Let's just say JFK wasn't the only one who had his mind open on November 23rd, 1963. I'll be honest, researching this video, I've changed my mind about what I think probably happened at least four times. It's a fascinating story, and it's made even more fascinating by the slow realization that there's almost no way we can ever be certain about what happened that day. So. I'm going to go over a few different interpretations of events, and you can decide yourself if you'd like to believe any of those, and I'll end the video by telling you what I think. Let's start with everybody's favorite interpretation, the official narrative from the government, the Warren Commission. Immediately following JFK's assassination, many people high in the government suspected a conspiracy of some kind. 
Lyndon B. Johnson, JFK's vice president, was appointed president almost immediately following his boss's execution. He selected Justice Earl Warren to lead the investigation into Kennedy's death. Warren was a Supreme Court judge known for his liberal progressive values and would theoretically be motivated to get to the truth of the situation. So the Warren Commission produced a massive report which connected the dots in the evidence in a way that they hoped would be palatable to the American people. According to this report, Lee Harvey Oswald had fired three shots from his window at the Texas School Book Depository, as evidenced by the three shells and the shotgun found next to a window on the sixth floor. Though the Warren Commission didn't actually specify what order the shots were fired in, it did specify exactly where each bullet went. Luckily for us, amateur investigators, a man named Abraham Zapruder was positioned right next to the road with a Bell & Howell home movie camera, and he caught the moment on film. This helps us get a pretty good idea of when each bullet hit, according to the Warren Commission. It's generally accepted by Warren Commission believers that the first shot missed the vehicle, the second shot hit JFK in the back, exiting through his neck, and then moving forward to hit Governor Connolly, who was seated in front of him. At this point, the president was still alive. The third bullet changed that hitting JFK right in the back of the head. Dallas police began investigating the murder. They were able to get eyewitness descriptions of a man seen in a sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository holding a rifle. A few hours later, after a cop was killed not far from Dealey Plaza, police found Oswald hiding in a movie theater and took him into custody. The Warren Commission looked deeply into Oswald's past, painting a picture of a mentally disturbed, insecure man with communist tendencies. A few months before the assassination, Oswald had lied to his family and taken a secret trip to Mexico City, where he'd visited the Cuban and Soviet embassies and aggressively demanded to be accepted back into the USSR and also to visit Cuba on his way there. He was denied this. He then did the only logical response to a bad rejection and ordered a rifle under a fake name, smuggled it into the Texas School Book Depository. His behavior was certainly odd, but there was absolutely no evidence that Oswald's decision to murder the president was put into motion or encouraged by any other person or group. In other words, the commission concluded that he'd acted alone. The Warren Commission decided that Jack Ruby had also acted alone. He was just a fan of the president who happened to be prone to violence. Nobody had told him what to do or where to be. He'd made the decision to pull the trigger all by himself. Jack Ruby's section of the Warren Report was much smaller and far less detailed than Oswald's, but after all, Ruby was less important. Ruby had only killed the guy who killed the president. Meanwhile, Oswald, he killed the president. The commission has found no evidence that either Lee Harvey Oswald or Jack Ruby was part of any conspiracy, domestic or foreign, to assassinate President Kennedy. Conspiracy. A quick note on language. The word conspiracy is a bit cursed. The way it's often used in the current political climate is almost as a synonym for made-up bullshit. But that's not what the word means. It simply refers to when a group of two or more people work together to deceive others. It takes two to tango, and it takes two, at least, to plan a conspiracy theory. And there are plenty of high-profile, real conspiracies. Jeffrey Epstein, Watergate, all the kids and teachers at my high school who convinced me prom was at the local sewage plant. So the word conspiracy has definitely got a bit of a stink to it these days, but it's actually quite a useful word when we are specifically talking about the JFK assassination. So since the official story put forward by the government in the Warren Commission is that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone and then Jack Ruby acted alone, that means the Warren Commission's idea of what happened is not a conspiracy theory. This narrative is sometimes referred to as the lone nut theory, but over here at Chill Goblin, we're making an effort to minimize ableist language, so I'm going with a kinder, gentler, non-problematic phrase to represent this point of view, the lone dipshit theory. If this is what you believe, it is the opposite of a conspiracy theory. It's a theory that there was no conspiracy. On the other hand, when we're talking about conspiracy theories, at least concerning the Kennedy assassination, we're talking about the belief that Oswald was not just a lone dipshit, that he was a dipshit in league with one or more other dipshits. Now, maybe you find the lone dipshit theory fully acceptable. Maybe you trust the government's official narrative every time. Maybe you're just a little bit of a sheep like that. That's okay. You can be a sheep, all right? There's that sheep are good. Listen, if it wasn't for sheep, I'd have cold feet in the winter. So, good job. Now, this is going to sound conspiratorial, but it seems very likely to me that the Warren Commission had been designed from the very beginning not to get to the truth, but to reassure the American public 
that there was nothing to see here. I know, I know, I know. But wait, just let me show you some direct quotes from the parties involved. The newly sworn in president, Lyndon B. Johnson, JFK's old vice, was the one who had the Warren Commission put together. Just hours after President Kennedy's death, a memo from the U.S. Attorney General was sent to LBJ. The memo stated that it was important the public believe that Oswald was the assassin, that he did not have Confederates who were still at large, and that the evidence was such that had Oswald lived, he would have been convicted at trial. Similarly, on the day after Oswald was assassinated, FBI head J. Edgar Hoover took a break from encouraging Martin Luther King to kill himself and gave a call to one of LBJ's aides. Hoover had his own advice for the new president. The thing I am concerned about is having something issued so we can convince the public that Oswald is the real assassin. So there was a lot of pressure on LBJ to prove that Oswald was a lone dipshit. Now, what did LBJ himself think really happened? In a 1973 interview in Atlantic Monthly, President Lyndon B. Johnson admitted, well, I never believe that Oswald acted alone, although I can accept that he pulled the trigger. We have to place this moment into the context of the Cold War. If the American people believed that the president had been killed by communist forces in Cuba or the USSR, there would be little alternative but to invade one or both of these communist countries and a little alternative during that fight but to blow up the world with a bunch of nukes. President Johnson asked Justice Earl Warren to head up the commission to discover what really happened. Warren was like, eh, I'm busy with Supreme Court stuff or whatever, get somebody else. President Johnson, who was a large, intimidating man and the third hottest president, had a conversation with Warren and convinced him to do it. We don't have the recording of this conversation, but Johnson himself described this conversation in a phone call to a California senator that was recorded. I told Justice Warren these wild people are charging Khrushchev killed Kennedy and Castro killed Kennedy and everybody else killed Kennedy. Now, we've had 60 FBI agents working for seven days. They got the story. They got the fingerprints. They got everything else. But the American people in the world have got to know who killed Kennedy and why. And somebody's got to evaluate that report. And if they don't, why, if Khrushchev moved on us, he could kill 39 million in an hour. Now, we could kill 100 million in his country in an hour. But here I'm asking you to do something, and you're saying no to everybody. When you could be speaking to 39 million people, and I just don't think you want to do that. President Johnson appears to have used two tactics to convince Justice Warren to take the job. One was that if he didn't, the world was going to get blowed up. Pretty convincing. The other was that the FBI already had all the evidence he'd need since we know that the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover had gone into the investigation intent to prove it had been a lone dipshit, it seems likely that LBJ knew when he appointed Warren what conclusion the commission would inevitably come to. And he would have done all this in service of a lone dipshit conclusion, even though he personally believed there had been a conspiracy, because he had a not at all irrational fear that an honest investigation into events could end the world in a nuclear holocaust. It's like if I flip a coin and I tell you that it's heads, but I never actually check it, it might very well be heads, but there's also a pretty good chance it was tails. Oh, damn. Turns out it was the deep state. I even know the Canadian Mint made coins like this. Huh, must be a collector's item. Cool. So the Warren Commission is an official government narrative, but it's not the official government narrative. Even the U.S. government is actually divided on this question. In 1979, the United States House of Representatives looked into the Kennedy assassination again during the House Select Committee on Assassinations. This time, they came to a different conclusion, which was that JFK probably was assassinated due to a conspiracy. So let's get into the conspiracy theories non-derogatory. The conspiracy theories. As soon as the Warren Commission was released, many people had issues with it. Amateur detectives, many of them women, went over the 888-page commission with a fine-toothed comb. It's wild that true crime used to inspire people to investigate the three-letter agencies, and now it just inspires people to call the cops because someone on next door saw an Amazon delivery guy tying his shoes. Now, the Warren Commission was never meant to actually be read. It was more of a thick visual symbol of the weight of the evidence for the lone dipshit theory than something anyone was supposed to actually open up. It didn't even have an index. Actually, an analyst for the World Health Organization and Warren Commission skeptic named Sylvia Meager devoted six months to creating her own annotated index for the document, which 
unlike a normal index, actually pointed out the contradictions and inconsistencies within the report. In an exact reversal of the way the Warren Commission used whatever evidence they could to prove Oswald acted alone, skeptics of the Warren Commission aimed to show that Oswald had at least one guy helping him. Remember, that's all they need to prove it was a conspiracy. So there's two ways we can do this, the easy way and the hard way. The easy way is if we could prove there was a second shooter at Dealey Plaza that day. More than one shooter, bam, this is conspiracy theory. We called it, we did it, conspiracy, boom. But who did it and why? Uh, we don't really know anything about the conspiracy, but we know that there was one. So much of the skepticism towards the Warren Commission centers around the day of the assassination itself. That presidential motorcade as it passed through Dealey Plaza was photographed, videotaped, and otherwise documented by multiple journalists and American presidency fans, which is a fandom more cringe than furries, bronies, and Homestuck combined. These records have been poured over to such an intense degree, putting every single second under a microscope that I think the attention to detail has somehow made things less clear. Now, the other thing we can do, the more difficult option, is to zoom out and look at the motivations of potential conspirators and look for evidence tying them to the assassination. So who would want to kill JFK and why? Are they at all connected to Oswald or Ruby? Over the years, people have had all kinds of answers to this question, and personally, I find this type of investigation much more interesting. So let's go over a few of both kinds of theories, and we'll start with a little place in Dealey Plaza you might have heard of called the Grassy Knoll. Right as JFK was getting killed, his car was passing by a particular spot at Dealey Plaza that's been called the Grassy Knoll. It seems like a lovely place for a picnic, and also the main location conspiracy theorists like to theorize about a second shooter. According to interviews with witnesses in Dealey Plaza that day, most said they heard gunshots coming from the Texas School Book Depository, but there was a sizable group that claimed they heard the gunshots coming from the direction of the grassy knoll out the right side of JFK's car. During the House Select Committee on Assassinations, through analysis of the recording of a policeman's radio, they concluded that... Scientific acoustical evidence establishes a high probability that at least two gunmen fired at the president's. Other scientific evidence does not preclude the possibility of two gunmen firing at the president's. Huh. But if there was a second shooter, who was it? Well, from photos and video of the assassination, we can see a man with an umbrella who put it up right as JFK passed in front of him. Now, this was not a rainy day, and nobody else has an umbrella. Why would he do that? Now, one interesting theory is that this guy was working with Oswald and the other shooters and raised the umbrella to signal when they should all fire so as to coordinate shots. Another, much more hilarious theory is that the umbrella man was himself a shooter and the umbrella was in actuality a hidden gun. In 1979, the Umbrella Man was actually questioned during the House Select Committee on Assassinations. His name was Louis Stephen Witt, and Louis said he was doing the Umbrella thing as a protest. Not as a protest against JFK, or Connolly, or anyone who was actually there, but against JFK's father, Joseph Kennedy. Now, Joseph Kennedy was an extremely wealthy man who had made his fortune in a variety of ways, the stock market, real estate, steel, Hollywood financing, scotch whiskey, and according to some braggadocious Chicago gangsters, Joseph had made a lot of his early fortune as an illegal bootlegger with the mob during Prohibition. But this has never actually been proven. It just seems extremely likely. Like a lot of rich gangsters, Joseph Kennedy hated communism with all his heart. In fact, the elder Kennedy was kind of like a privileged political Richard Williams who trained each of his sons specifically to become president one day. For some reason, most of his children died before they could become president other than JFK, who died while he was president. Anyway, the real Umbrella Man wasn't concerned with any of that. Joseph Kennedy had also been a politician, serving as the ambassador to the UK from 1938 to 1940. Ooh, did I make a weird noise when I said that? <clears throat> Sorry, I... I don't know where that came from. History buffs out there will know that uh, this was an eventful time for the United Kingdom, and apparently old man Kennedy had strongly supported Neville Chamberlain with his appeasement of Hitler and the Nazis. Louis was still mad about this, and had chosen to open his umbrella as JFK rolled past him because the umbrella was an iconic part of Neville Chamberlain's aesthetic. 
You know, you see an umbrella, you think, oh, it's like that guy who was letting Hitler get away with stuff. Anyway, I don't know how Louis expected Joseph to see him raising his umbrella, but the weird thing is that due to events, it's almost certain that he eventually did. Joseph Kennedy watching the Zapruder film like, oh my god, my son dying, that sucks. But also that guy with the umbrella, is that about me? I just can't catch a break today. Just imagine doing a weird little symbolic act of protest like this and all your activist friends tell you this is a waste of time, it's not how real change happens, you need to be getting involved in your community, raising an umbrella doesn't change anything, and then and you go and you raise your silly little umbrella and as soon as you do, the president dies. And he's just like, I need to cool it a bit. Okay, better stick to throwing Molotovs at cops. All right, let's take a break from putting the events of November 22nd, 1963 under a microscope for a bit because... Again, I find that is the least interesting part about this whole thing. Why squint at grainy footage looking for some murderous Mary Poppins when we could ask ourselves, who would want to kill a handsome guy like JFK? And why? Who would want to kill a handsome person? The commies! Well, the very first conspiracy theory ever published regarding the murder of JFK blamed Fidel Castro and Cuba. A group of anti-Castro Cuban students in a group called the Directorio Revolucionario Estudiantil, or DRE, published a special edition of their newspaper the day after the assassination, where Lee Harvey Oswald and Castro's face were posted side by side and captioned, The Presumed Assassins. The DRE was actually familiar with Lee Harvey Oswald. They knew him. But... More on that in a bit. Now, why would the communists in Cuba, or communists at all, want JFK dead? Well, it's no secret that during JFK's administration, Cuba and America had, let's just say, butted heads. The CIA and U.S. government actually invaded Cuba in 1961 with a CIA-trained army of Cuban dissidents during the Bay of Pigs, an act of aggression so volatile that it nearly became a full-scale U.S. military invasion of Cuba. Then, in 1962, there was the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the USSR attempted to bring nuclear missiles into Cuba. Now, this is a fucked up thing to do, okay? No question about it. But it's made slightly less fucked up uh, by the fact that the U.S. had already brought nuclear missiles into several states bordering the USSR. But, because... As we all know, the rules are that the U.S. gets to do whatever it wants, and nobody else can do that. Stop it. So JFK and his Joint Chiefs of Staff decided to bring the world to the brink of nuclear annihilation. To JFK's credit, the world did not actually end. Pretty low bar here, if we're being honest, but we're talking about U.S. presidents, so I'll take what I can get. So JFK convinced Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, to back off of Cuba in exchange for the U.S. pulling weapons out of Turkey and Italy. Now, this Kennedy-Khrushchev agreement had several consequences, like the fact that you and all your little friends get to be alive. Isn't that nice? Lee Harvey Oswald himself actually had some connections to both Cuba and the USSR. As mentioned, he was a U.S. Marine who defected to the USSR and offered to reveal U.S. secrets. Though he eventually moved back to America, he was actively involved with pro-Cuba movements. He was the sole member of his local chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, which was at the time the nation's most prominent organization against U.S. imperialism toward Cuba. Curiously, Oswald had, at the same time and in the same city, joined the DRE, the Organization of Anti-Castro Cubans I mentioned earlier. In August of 1963, this conflict of interest led to a public confrontation. Oswald was handing out pro-Castro flyers, and some of his acquaintances from the DRE spotted him and recognized him. Now, the ensuing brawl got Oswald arrested for disturbing the peace and also earned him a spot on the radio to talk about his communist views. Though, as he said in the interview, he didn't consider himself a communist, but a Marxist-Leninist, which, okay, dude, R.I.P. Lee Harvey Oswald. He would have loved Twitter. At the end of September 1963, Oswald traveled to Mexico City, where records indicate he visited the Cuban and Soviet embassies and spoke with Valery Kostikov, the head of KGB assassinations. So, on the surface... It's easy to see why people might assume that this communist who had defected to the USSR, uh, perhaps infiltrated an anti-Castro group, and met with the KGB assassination dude, might have been put up to this by Khrushchev or Castro or both. But I gotta say, I think that's very unlikely to be the case. First of all, Khrushchev and Castro both kind of liked Kennedy. They thought he was pretty good for a U.S. president. 
Obviously, he was still a U.S. president and not an actual ally, but even after the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis, tensions were actually cooling between JFK and the leaders of the communist world. Kennedy had given a speech at American University that was so pro-peace, it would somehow become a crossover hit in the USSR. I have, therefore, chosen this time and this place to discuss a topic on which ignorance too often abounds and the truth is too rarely perceived. Yet it is the most important topic on Earth. World peace. What kind of peace do I mean and what kind of peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced upon the world by American weapons of war? Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave? I'm talking about a genuine peace. The kind of peace that makes life on Earth worth living. The kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace for all time. JFK had made an effort to find a back channel of communication with Khrushchev that wouldn't be tainted by interference from the rabid anti-communist forces he was surrounded by, like the CIA or the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He'd been in talks with Castro and had given him an American contact, James Donovan, who was actually interested in a good-faith negotiation with the Caribbean country. Just one day before JFK's assassination, Castro proclaimed that Kennedy still had the opportunity to become the greatest American president in history. He jokingly offered to Donovan that he would be willing to endorse JFK's opponent in the upcoming election if it would help Kennedy's chances. JFK was certainly more reasonable to deal with directly than through his official advisors on military matters, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Just to give a taste of the type of advice JFK was getting on national defense, let's look at one particular member of the Joint Chiefs named General Curtis LeMay. LeMay was a major hater of JFK's foreign policy, especially what he saw as JFK's bizarre insistence on not ending the world during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He even told JFK that refusing to drop an atomic bomb on Cuba was equivalent to ignoring Hitler's rise, probably a personal dig at the side JFK's father had taken at that time. When that umbrella guy was explaining what his deal was, LeMay was probably the one guy just losing his shit at how epic the umbrella roast was. Just. Just during Kennedy's presidency, LeMay pressured him to bomb Cuba, Moscow, and the tiny country of Laos. And after Kennedy's death, LeMay would go on to coin the phrase, bomb them back to the Stone Age during the war in Vietnam. He would later run for vice president on a far-right ticket with infamous segregationist George Wallace. And yeah, I know my drawing of him makes him look cartoonishly evil, but he actually looks even more like a Disney villain in real life. Holy shit. The other thing is, on the off chance it actually was Castro who killed JFK, I'm sorry, but Americans are not allowed to be mad about that. The U.S. State Department, the Joint Chief of Staff, and the CIA, with the knowledge and consent of the president, had been putting in a staggering amount of effort trying to kill Castro for years. William Harvey was an agent who once worked for Hoover at the FBI, but was fired for being drunk on the job. Um, but then as a CIA agent, he became known for drinking more than anyone else in U.S. government. And this was during the first Irish presidential administration. Anyway, I guess for being the king of the keg stand, Harvey was appointed the CIA's head of assassinations, which is quite an intense thing to put on your business card. I assume the card was also secretly a gun. Now, there were around 638 attempts to assassinate Castro by the CIA and the United States, at least 42 of which occurred during John F. Kennedy's short time as president. Harvey and the CIA had what can only be described as a wily e. Coyote relationship to the Cuban Roadrunner. Now, these cartoonish murder hijinks included exploding cigars, poison cigars, LSD-laced cigars, Placing bombs disguised as beautiful seashells on the beach Fidel liked to swim at. Personally, I think they really jumped the shark when they moved away from novelty cigars, but that's just me. But once knowing that Donovan was a legitimate friend of Fidel, the CIA smeared a scuba suit with a flesh-eating virus and told Donovan to give it to Fidel as a gift. Now, this plan failed because by pure coincidence, Donovan had just given Castro a diving suit of his own idea. Oh, sorry guys, I literally just gave him one of these. Uh, wish you could have asked me last week. Could have saved me some shopping. 
But I'll take it if you're not, oh, no, you have to put it in an incinerator? Okay. On one memorable occasion, the CIA sent a spy named Marita Lorenz to become intimate with Castro and use that opportunity to assassinate him. Now, this last one failed because, well, I'll just read you her quote. He was very tired and wanted to sleep. He was chewing on a cigar and he laid down on the bed and said, did you come here to kill me? Just like that. I was standing at the edge of the bed. I said, yes, I wanted to see you. And he said, that's good, that's good. And then he leaned over, pulled out his 45 and handed it to me. I flipped the chamber out and hit it back. He didn't even flinch. And he said, you can't kill me. Nobody can kill me. And he kind of smiled and chewed on his cigar. I felt deflated. He was so sure of me. He just grabbed me. We made love. Wild stuff, eh? Anyway, well, this is to say, the CIA tried a lot of different ways to kill Castro. In fact, while Kennedy was getting killed, the CIA was putting the finishing touches on a poison needle pen they planned to covertly send a Castro assassin into Cuba with. Now, the last CIA attempt on Castro's life that we know of was in the year 2000, when Castro was 74. They tried putting 90 kilograms of explosives under a podium Castro was speaking at. 90 kilograms, an amount you might use if you believed your one-man target to be basically immortal. Anyway, 638 failed attempts to kill Castro by the U.S., and people think Cuba did JFK? Yes, despite the forced poverty and lack of essential supplies imposed by the U.S.'s cruel trade embargo on them, Cuba has somehow managed to do better than America on several key statistics. They have a higher life expectancy, a higher literacy rate, and an infinitely better track record at killing the other's head of state. For a variety of reasons, the idea that Cuba or the Soviets had sent Oswald after the one U.S. president they were kind of starting to get along with can mostly, I would say, be discarded. I'm skipping ahead a little bit here, but this is a theory that's been promoted by many at the CIA, like James Jesus Angleton, who never stopped believing and promoting that theory. And that article published by the DRE, well, the DRE was a CIA front, which received $25,000 per month from a man named George Joannides, who was the head of the CIA's psychological warfare department. His business card is just a sheet of acid. Now, that Castro-Oswald connection they published so immediately after the assassination, complete CIA op. Finally, there's something a bit weird about Oswald's trip to Mexico. The FBI, under J. Edgar Hoover, had found so much damning information about Oswald's life. In addition to the record of his trip to Mexico, they also found evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald had been practicing with his gun at a firing range in the days leading up to the assassination. The problem was, now, this Oswald was seen on September 28, 1963, the same time Oswald was supposed to be in Mexico. The Warren Report actually acknowledges this impossibility. Moreover, the date on which the unknown person was seen at the rifle range was September 28, 1963, but Oswald's known to have been in Mexico City at that time, since a comparison of the events testified to by other Oswald witnesses at the rifle range strongly suggests they were describing the same man there is reason to believe that these witnesses were also describing a man other than Oswald. Ah, you know, the SBI works hard and sometimes they give you so much great evidence against somebody that they end up being in multiple places at the same time. Okay, so no big deal, right? Witnesses must have just seen an Oswald look like at the rifle range. After all, there are a ton of guys who look like this and also enjoy shooting guns. It's called Resting Dealey Plaza Face and you'll see it all over the world. But there's also some weirdness around Oswald's trip to Mexico. The day after the assassination, the Johnson administration was already aware of Oswald's trip to the Soviet embassy in Mexico City and were looking for more information about it. President Johnson took a call at 10 a.m. with FBI Director Hoover, who was receiving evidence from the CIA about Oswald's trip south of the border that didn't seem quite right. Have you established any more about the visit to the Soviet embassy in Mexico in September? No, that's the one angle that's very confusing for this reason. We have up here the tape and the photograph of the man who was at the Soviet embassy using Oswald's name. That picture and tape do not correspond to this man's voice, nor to his appearance. In other words, it appears that there is a second person who was at the Soviet embassy down there. Now, if we can identify this man who was at the Soviet embassy in Mexico City... 
You know, you're mad at your coworker and you want to tattle on them to your boss, but you don't want to be too direct about it? I get the impression here that Hoover is subtly telling the president that the CIA is just making shit up to make the communists look guilty. I don't have the tape recording of a man calling himself Lee Harvey Oswald that Hoover claimed he listens to, but I do have the photographs. I don't know, is this Lee Harvey Oswald? Probably not, unless he got access to some very fast-acting Mexican steroids. That may have been why they rejected him. If this guy's saying he's natty, what else is he lying about? It appears that Hoover strongly suspected that the CIA was trying to plant evidence of an Oswald Soviet plot to kill Kennedy. A few months later, Hoover scribbled a sassy little note at the bottom of an internal FBI memo. It concerned FBI attempts to keep up with illegal CIA operations within the United States. Apparently, somebody at the FBI had asked the CIA if they were doing anything like that, and the CIA told them no. Hoover wrote, Okay, but I hope you're not being taken in. I can't forget the CIA withholding the French espionage activities in the USA, nor the false story regarding Oswald's trip to Mexico, only to mention two instances of their double dealing. The easy explanation for all this weirdness is that Oswald did go to the Soviet embassy and request a visa and request to speak to Kostikov, and the CIA just failed to get a photo of him on his way out. That's definitely possible. The CIA has been known to fuck up all the time, but J. Edgar Hoover seems to really believe that Oswald never was in Mexico, and as far as I know, there's only circumstantial evidence that he was there at this time, nothing definite. <laughs> it's another weird thing, is what it is. Badge man! All right, we're taking a trip back to the grassy knoll for this one. If Umbrella Man wasn't the culprit, is there any other evidence of a second shooter from that day? Uh, hopefully with another weird superhero type name? Well, there are cameras all over the place, it turns out there is another photo of a proposed second shooter. Here's the photo. So there he is. And I, oh, you don't see him? Okay, well, let me zoom in there. Okay, how about that? No? All right, well, let me color it in for you. See him now? Now, what might at first look like just random shapes of light hitting some bushes, on closer examination, and if you unfocus your eyes and look past the screen, uh, suddenly becomes possibly a man blowing his nose. And if we really use our imagination, it might look like a cop with a badge shooting a gun. Now, I think people just read into uh, random shapes, whatever they've got on their mind. Personally, I think it's pretty clear this is a photo of my parents arguing. But if you actually go to this location and measure him up, the man would have been about 2.8 feet tall. I don't want to rule anything out here, so let's just say it's at the very least possible that JFK, who was, after all, the first Irish president, had stolen a pot of gold from the end of the rainbow and made himself a target of the International Leprechaun Secret Police Force. The mob. The mafia. <laughs> Judging by every dude's dorm room I've ever been in, mafia guys are probably the primary model of masculinity us bros have to aspire to. But I gotta say, the more I learn about the mafia, the less I care for them. A lot of them seem like real jerks. It's a difficult truth to accept because in any honest list of the top 10 movies ever made, you got nine movies about the mob and Wayne's World 2. But as it turns out though, many, not all, mob guys are bad people with terrible politics. And there are a lot of people who think that the American mafia might have had something to do with JFK's death. So let's start with a motive. Have you seen The Irishman, the three and a half hour long Martin Scorsese movie that asks the provocative question, should this maybe have been a TV show instead? And also, did the mafia disappear Jimmy Hoffa? And also, did the mafia kill JFK? It asks a lot of provocative questions, I guess. It's a three and a half hour movie. What do you want? In The Irishman, as well as in real life, the mafia has a direct involvement in getting Kennedy elected. But once he was in office, his brother Bobby Kennedy started going after organized crime really hard, which the Cosa Nostra thought was kind of mean and no fair. So they killed the president they helped elect. That's definitely one potential motivation the Mafia may have had for whacking the president, though I find it very hard to believe the mob would be like, Oh, Roberto Kennedy's busting our balls over here. We gotta stop this. Now, obviously, we can't whack Bobby, all right? He's a United States Attorney General. There's no way we can get to him. Much easier thing to do would be to kill his brother, the president. Once we do that... Bobby's not gonna have a job no more. Bibbly bobbly boo, gabagool for everybody. Right? There's just one problem with this theory. It's 
highly unlikely that they'd speak in such a terrible Italian accent. There's another, more convincing reason the mob might want to kill JFK, and it actually has a lot to do with Fidel Castro and Cuba. Now, before the revolution, Cuba was a massive cash cow for a lot of American businesses, but also the American mob. American gangsters had made millions of dollars running casinos and organized crime in Havana, Cuba, with the full cooperation of the far-right Batista regime. When the revolutionaries took over, they wanted to stop legal and illegal American businesses from extracting that Cuban wealth and taking their profits off the island, so they just kicked everybody out, even the mob guys. Have you seen Godfather 2? There's a part where they go to Cuba to launch a new casino business or something in Havana, and then while they're there, the revolution happens, and they lose everything, and Michael's like, Fredo, I know it was you! And you're watching, and you're like, oh, this movie's so good, I don't even care that it's going a little Forrest Gump right now. The mob, like any group of American businessmen who had previously been making boatloads of money off Cuban tourism, absolutely hated Castro. In fact, remember the CIA's 638 attempts to kill Castro? Well, it turns out that for a bunch of those attempts, the CIA hired mob guys. It made sense as an alliance. Knowing they shared a hatred of Castro, the CIA paid untold numbers of mafia hitmen to shoot the guy twice in the head or give him a poison pill or whatever else. Of course, none of these attempts worked either. When asked about how he survived all of these mafia attacks, Fidel Castro reportedly said, meep, meep. How did the CIA get in touch with the Mafia? Well, we actually have a lot of the details here. William Harvey, the drunk head of assassinations, decided he'd like to meet some Mafia guys. Also, he needed help killing Castro. He reached out to Robert Mayhew, a former FBI agent who was at the time working as a surrogate for eccentric billionaire Howard Hughes. Mayhew introduced Harvey to Johnny Roselli, handsome Johnny who would become Harvey's close friend and drinking buddies, which I guess it's kind of redundant to say about Harvey's close friends. The CIA would rely on Roselli's mafia connections many, many times over the years. We know for sure two high-ranking mafia dons who became involved in these clandestine operations. One was Florida boss Santo Traficante, and I feel the need to clarify, this was the guy's real name from birth. He was actually Santo Traficante Jr., and he had inherited both his name and his control over criminal operations in Florida and Cuba from his Mafia Don father. Now, the other guy was Chicago Outfit boss Sam Giancana, who, incredibly, had a mistress named Judith Exner, who was also having disappointing sex with President Kennedy. Now, both Giancana and Traficante were listed on the FBI's most wanted list, which means that while one American intelligence agency was trying to gather information to arrest them, the other was just hiring them to kill people. <laughs> Great to know how well the government works. Giancana and Traficante had both once had major businesses in Cuba, which made them ideologically aligned with the U.S. government who wanted Castro dead. So we know for sure they were involved in plots to kill Castro, but would they have coordinated a plan to kill JFK? In addition to wanting his little brother Bobby to stop breathing down their necks, it's easy to imagine these gangsters still sour over their lost businesses in Cuba, getting frustrated with Big Giovanni Kennedy himself. They would have been hearing about JFK refusing to send the military to Cuba during the Bay of Pigs, or peacefully negotiating his way out of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he couldn't blame them for getting the feeling that a president like Nixon probably would have made different, more mafia-friendly choices. Though they were not considered for testimony during the Warren Commission, Johnny Roselli, Sam Giancana, and Santo Traficante were all requested to attend court during either the Church Committee or the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Roselli was unable to give his final testimony as he had to call in sick when he came down with a sudden case of being cut into pieces and stuffed into an oil drum in Miami, Florida. Meanwhile, Sam Giancana was supposed to testify at the church committee about CIA and mafia collaboration, but he was stuck at home, busy dealing with getting seven bullets to the back of his head and neck. Santo Torrafacante was also invited to testimony at the church committee, and he, he actually made it. Uh, he testified that, yes, he had worked with the CIA to kill Castro. He'd been recruited by Sam Giancana and Johnny Roselli, who'd been recruited by Mayhew, but that his only role was as a Spanish-to-English translator, which is surprising, because I feel like... You could get a Spanish translator who isn't also a powerful mafia don. Anyway, the church committee asked him point blank, had he ever been involved in a plot to kill Kennedy? And he said, absolutely not. But after his death, his old attorney claimed he'd relayed an order to kill Kennedy from Jimmy Hoffa to Santo Traficante, so there's that evidence if you want to count it. Uh, the testimony of a man in the world's most trustworthy occupation, mob lawyer. 
Well, it's his word against the word of a humble Spanish to English translator. It's very difficult to connect JFK's killer Lee Harvey Oswald to the mafia whatsoever. However, it does appear that there were various mob connections to JFK's killer's killer, Jack Ruby. Did Ruby really have mafia ties? Well, when he shot Lee Harvey Oswald, he said one of the most stereotypically gangster things I can imagine someone saying under the circumstances. You killed my president, you rat. I rest my case. Oh, shit. Damn it. I had this there the whole time. I am not going back. I've come too far and this video is too long. Sorry. There's just going to be a bottle. Does that root? Does that wreck the immersion for you? Gotta stay hydrated. What can I say? Ruby claimed that he committed this murder on live TV because he wanted to save the president's wife, Jackie, the pain of a trial. Do we buy that? I don't know. I'm trying to imagine this violent nightclub owner who rubs shoulders with crooked cops and mobsters, but anytime someone makes an off-color remark about Jackie Kennedy, he's like, oh, what's that I heard you say about the voice lady? She's an angel. Don't you ever forget it. Now come here. I'm going to throw you down the stairs. That's, that's my thing. It's the beginning of Winnie. It's like the beginning of Winnie the Pooh. You ever read Winnie the Pooh? Here comes Edward Bear down the stairs. Bump, bump, bump. That's you. But the bumps are gonna be with a couple of brass knuckles. But then the rest will all be stairs. I gotta work on the way that I. I want to think of a cool way to threaten people about this. Sorry, I just rewatched The Sopranos. I can't stop doing that voice. It's an illness, and you should pity me. Uh, and I should well, I'll also say Ruby wasn't even Italian. The House Select Committee on Assassinations investigated Jack Ruby's ties with organized crime. They found that Jack Ruby had been an associate of Sam Giancana's since at least 1947, and the two had been seen many times together. They also found circumstantial evidence that Ruby may have paid a visit to Santo Traficante in a Cuban cell in 1959. What else was going on with Jack Ruby around this time? Well, he was in a huge amount of tax debt and was being hounded by the IRS and closely monitored by the FBI. In the three months leading up to the assassination, the FBI noted that Ruby made a lot of calls to crime bosses around the country, possibly including Giancana and Traficante. He had been in contact with forces like these before, usually when he was desperate for money to save his various failing nightclubs. In the months before the shooting, though, his calls to organized crime apparently increased 25 times over, which seems like a lot. A few days before the end, Ruby apparently told his lawyer out of nowhere that everything was okay. He had a lot of money now. He also called a friend of his and invited them to come watch the presidential motorcade with him in Dealey Plaza. Now, he didn't know this, but his friend was an undercover informant for the FBI who made an official record of this conversation. Now, this report wasn't released to the public until 2017, but according to this FBI spy, Ruby's exact words were, would you like to watch the fireworks? Which... That's a weird way to invite someone to see a presidential motorcade. I'd be like, it's just a dude driving by. This isn't July 1st. But maybe Ruby was referring to the fireworks in his heart when he saw his crush, Jackie Kennedy, in real life. According to the Warren Report, Jack Ruby was several blocks away from Dealey Plaza when he heard the news of the president's assassination. During the investigation, Jack Ruby strangely remarked, the commission didn't even ask me another question. If I love the president so much, why wasn't I at the parade? Well... From that same FBI report released in 2017, it appears that this assumption from the Warren Commission was also incorrect. The FBI report claims that Ruby and his FBI friend watched the motorcade from the Postal Annex building, which is located on Dealey Plaza, directly across from the Texas School Book Depository. In prison, Jack Ruby was questioned by the CIA. After that, he appears to have lost his mental faculties and then died of several types of cancer. He mostly maintained the same weird story that he'd killed Oswald to spare Jackie the pain and travel expenses of a trial, although a few years after the assassination in 1965, Ruby said in a televised news conference, Everything pertaining to what's happening has never come to the surface. The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motives. The people who had so much to gain and had such an ulterior motive for putting me in the position I'm in will never let the true facts come above board to the world. Are these people in very high positions, Jack? Yes. Right before he died, Ruby spoke to his psychiatrist and said, The JFK assassination was an act of overthrowing the government. I know who had President Kennedy killed. I am doomed. I do not want to die, but I am not insane. I was framed to kill Oswald. Yeah, that was not as fun to read in that voice. Ah, well. I think that's all the Italian 
accent I'm going to be doing. Maybe not. I don't really remember. Unfortunately, Cancer got Ruby before he could elaborate on what the hell he was talking about here. Hopefully, Cancer is able to tell us a little bit more before it too gets whacked on live TV. All right, we're back at Dealey Plaza for this section. Let's talk about one of the more well-known theories. And this one isn't as much its own theory as it is a way of just ruthlessly clowning on the Warren Commission. It's called the Magic Bullet Theory. Wow! <laughs> Here I am. Make a wish on a magic bullet. What you need, well, I can pull it. Of course, I'm the magic bullet. Whatever you want, whatever you need, this bullet happily and readily obliges you. It is indeed a magic bullet. Howdy, partners. My name is Warren Commission Exhibit 399, but y'all can call me the magic bullet. That's right, <laughs> magic. With a wave of my animated hand, I make those pesky inconsistencies in your presidential investigation disappear. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people say. You see, when the Warren Commission was attempting to piece together what happened based on the evidence of Lee Harvey Oswald's gun and the recovered bullets, as well as the wounds on JFK and Connolly's bodies, there was a problem. Nobody could agree on what the evidence showed. Now, there were three shell casings found in Lee Harvey Oswald's little hideaway. Okay, so Oswald shot three bullets. Now, if you want to believe in the lone dipshit theory, it's important that there are no more than three bullets. Otherwise, you got to explain a second shooter one of the bullets appears to have missed the car entirely, so that's one accounted for. Another one definitely hit Kennedy in the head and killed him. Okay, there's two. We've got one left. But when we examine the bodies of JFK and Governor Connolly, we've got seven entry and exit wounds unaccounted for. Could one bullet possibly do all that? Well, the FBI thought that all three bullets must have hit targets in the car. The CIA actually concluded in a report to the Warren Commission that there must have been a second shooter, which is Incidentally, why the funniest thing to say to someone that's really into a second gunman theory is, oh, so you believe the CIA narrative of events. Those who support the Warren Commission couldn't use either of those explanations. They needed something else. Well, that's where I come in. The Warren Commission concluded that I must have come flying in from the Texas Book Depository. Then I hit Mr. President Kennedy in the back and came out the front of his neck. After that, I sauntered over at a leisurely pace, right old to old Mr. Connolly, and I dove into his right armpit and just so, and exited below his right nipple, you see there? Took a quick stop off in Connolly's wrist, <laughs> and then... All right, okay, okay, this is uh, coming off a bit weird. Maybe this was in bad taste to try and do. We get it. You ended up embedded in Governor Connolly's thigh. Actually, no. Before the thigh, I took a little detour out of Texas over to California and hit the daggum toilet seat back up right after Justice Earl Warren had most considerably put it down. I say, I say, then I came back to Dallas and embedded myself into Mr. Governor Connolly's thigh. <laughs> and even after all that, I looked fresh as a newborn baby goat. Right. Okay, whatever. So this theory has been mocked basically since it was put forward. Uh, it's worth noting that Governor Connolly himself thinks that the single bullet theory is bullshit. And it's very easy to sarcastically ask how a bullet could zip around and change direction like that. It doesn't make sense, right? Well, here's the thing. I'm not an expert uh, on anything, but I think that the magic bullet theory is actually credible. And to clarify, I'm saying that the single bullet theory laid out in the Warren Commission is actually... Quite possible. Oh, you don't believe in the magic bullet. You're like the Scrooge of the Kennedy assassination. Well, you better watch out, because I could teach a valuable lesson to your back, neck, armpit, nipple, wrist, and thigh. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it again. I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> well, all right. Okay, there's no call for that. Let me just say what I'm thinking. Uh, first of all, the car they were in wasn't a regular old car. It was a weird car built for presidential motorcades. Kennedy and his wife Jackie in the back were elevated so they could be seen by the crowd. And then Governor Connolly's seat was a bit to the left, and it was really cramped. Secondly, human anatomy is weird, and we tend not to think about it very often. If you want to get better at drawing people, you got to draw quick figure drawings of people in all kinds of different positions from all kinds of different angles. And one thing you learn is that a lot of assumptions we have about what the body does when it's at rest are completely wrong. 
every magic bullet theory diagram I've ever seen poses human beings like they're Lego figures. No, people bend weird, and your necks don't come straight out of your shoulder. Thirdly, bullets move really, really fast, and they are designed to go through human flesh and bone. Now, sometimes they get messed up and destroyed. Sometimes they come out looking almost pristine. It's weird that the magic bullet only got a little banged up, but it's not that weird. So let's take a look at this still from the Zapruder film. This is from right before the car moved behind this sign, which is when the magic bullet would have been fired. And here's a clearer photo of JFK and Connolly in the car during the motorcade. So JFK slouched over, he's relaxed, chill, unbothered, moisturized, in his lane, focused, flourishing. Now you can imagine a bullet shot from above, entering his back and exiting his neck on a downward angle. Now keep in mind, Connolly's seat is shifted to the left, and you can imagine the bullet leaving JFK's neck, traveling downward and entering Connolly's right armpit. Connolly looks a bit cramped in his governor's seat, he's looking out the right side of the car, probably angled a bit to his right, so it makes sense that the bullet would end up in his left thigh. And he had his hand there, which is just an unfortunate coincidence for him. That's why you should always be waving out the car window, and if anyone says otherwise, send them this video and tell them if they want more, then they should like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, and become a patron. Please join my Patreon, my girlfriend needs a new wig. And they're expensive. Now hang on there just a minute, dadgummit. Here's a little old magic trick for y'all. They didn't even find me at the crime scene. They found me later on at the hospital like I just fell out of the sky. Okay, well that would make sense because you were embedded in Connolly's thigh, so yeah, you were found on his stretcher. That's, that's not that weird. Well, I'm not just that concerned. It. The police officers were supposed to write the times down when they had me in their possession. Up until I got put away into evidence... But a few of the times simply don't line up. <laughs> Ain't nothing to it but a global conspiracy. Well, no, police are generally very bad at their jobs, dude. I mean, you know, obviously they're supposed to be thorough, especially with such an important case, but they're also supposed to serve and protect citizens, and how's that working out? To be honest, I'd be more suspicious if you'd been cataloged perfectly. Honestly, in my opinion, there's no magic here. There's just a really damaging shot that entered and exited human bodies seven times before coming to a stop, which was then handled badly by a bunch of incompetent cops. Dag nabbit, you mean I ain't no magic bullet after all? <laughs> That's right, MB. I guess we learned that the real magic was just believing in yourself. Whatever you say, Mr. Goblin. Well, I suppose that means this is goodbye sentience. <laughs> so long. Anyway, enough about magic bullets, let's talk about the Washington bullets, otherwise known as the CIA. Okay, here we go, the CIA. Probably the most popular group to blame for the death of JFK. Now, this is the one that Oliver Stone believes, and Martin Sheen. Canonically, this is also what Q thinks. Could all these people really be wrong? Now, does Lee Harvey Oswald have any links to the CIA? Well, when you look over his life story, there is a weird amount of potential connections to the Alphabet Boys. Senator Richard Schweiker was a member of the church committee that investigated the CIA in relation to the mob and Castro assassination plots, and after investigating Oswald's life story, he said, We don't know what happened, but we do know Oswald had intelligence connections. Everywhere you look with him, there are the fingerprints of intelligence. It's a strange way to put it, but he's not wrong. So let's take another look at this promising young man's life and count the fingerprints of intelligence. Now, when Oswald was 13, he was arrested for truancy and subject to examination by a psychiatrist named Dr. Renatus Hartogs, who would later work with the CIA's MK Ultra program. Hartogs would be interviewed by the Warren Commission in his psychological profile of Oswald as a disturbed man with a defiant attitude towards all authority would become the go-to explanation for Oswald's actions. At 15, Oswald would join the Civil Air Patrol, a social group for young boys to learn the important lessons of how to fly planes and die for their country. Now, this group was funded by wealthy Texas oil man and defense contractor David Harold Byrd, who also owned the Texas School Book Depository where Oswald would be employed during JFK's final motorcade. I'm not sure if Byrd has any CIA connections, but a lot of oil dudes were involved in the CIA in some way. While in the Marines, Oswald was stationed at Atsugi Naval Air Base in Japan. Now, Atsugi happens to have been a very important base for the CIA for two reasons. One, it was a hub for U-2 spy planes, 
And it was also a place where the CIA was doing a bunch of experiments with LSD. And not the fun kind of LSD experiments you do with your friends running around the woods. It's kind of wild that Oswald is, you know, telling everyone what a communist he is. And he's working on these top secret U-2 spy planes base. You know what I mean? Also, Oswald studied and became fluent in Russian while in the military, which could suggest special training in preparation for deep cover spy work or just a regular old hyperfixation for the world's only communist U.S. Marine. After being discharged and apparently broke, Oswald defected to the Soviet Union. So he first flew to Finland with $203 in his bank account, and somehow he was able to stay in two of the most expensive hotels in Helsinki before taking a train into Moscow. Now, this seems suspicious, but it's very possible he was just carrying around a bunch of cash that he saved while being a Marine who almost never left his room. In 1961, Oswald made it known that he wished to defect from being a defector and return to the United States. He was the subject of a ton of paperwork inside the CIA, FBI, State Department, and Office of Naval Intelligence. But surprisingly, Oswald encountered no resistance at all to his plan. Even though he was an avowed communist, even though he had very publicly defected to the Soviet Union by promising to reveal U.S. military secrets, even though he had remained in the country for two years, even though he was bringing with him his Russian wife, who had been raised by a KGB officer. This was the 60s, the height of Cold War paranoia, and when Lee and Marina Oswald sought to immigrate to America, the State Department not only allowed this, but provided them with a $435 loan to help pay for their travel. Back in America, Lee and Marina befriended George de Morenschild, an eccentric Russian immigrant and oil man who we now know was a CIA informant. De Morenschild helped the couple adjust to life in the U.S., getting them jobs, ensuring that Marina's rotten teeth were fixed, and assisting with the process of getting their child inoculated. Now, George was such a large part of Oswald's life in Texas that he holds the honor of giving the longest testimony out of any witness questioned by the Warren Commission, during which he never mentioned that he was working with the CIA, although he did mention that Lee Harvey Oswald talked about how much he liked JFK. Anyway, uh, let's do a quick tangent here on George Morenschild, actually. Years later, George de Morenschild was attempting to write a book about Lee Harvey Oswald when he became convinced the CIA was trying to kill him. He stopped writing this book and sent a letter to the head of the CIA at the time, George H.W. Bush, asking him to please call off the attacks from the CIA. Bush Sr. sent him a letter saying that he hadn't heard of any attempts to prevent his book's publication, but he wished him well. Um, actually, let's do a quick tangent on George H.W. Bush. So during the Kennedy assassination, Bush Sr. was not officially a member of the CIA. He was yet another child of filthy rich parents who was playing at being an oil man. It seems likely that he was, like DeMorn Shield and many other people in the oil industry, also doing work for the CIA. And you know how everyone remembers where they were when Kennedy was shot? Well, Bush Sr. can't remember what he was up to that day. All he knows is that he was in Dallas, the city JFK was shot in, which makes it even weirder that the day wasn't memorable for him. Okay, back to DeMorenschild. On March 29th, 1977, DeMorenschild said in an interview that he had been instructed by the CIA to contact Oswald in the first place. That same day, he received a request to appear before the House Select Committee on Assassinations for more Lee Harvey Oswald questions, and that afternoon, George was found dead in his home from a shotgun wound, which the coroner ruled a suicide. Okay, back to Oswald. There was a party thrown by De Morenschild where the Oswalds met a woman named Ruth Payne. Ruth Payne's mother-in-law had been an acquaintance of Alan Dulles, the former CIA director. Ruth Payne was the one who got Oswald his fateful job at the Texas School Book Depository, and Ruth's garage is where Oswald hid his Manlicker Carcano 6.5 rifle until November 22nd on National Bring Your Rifle to Work Day. Oh, your screen is disgusting. Let me get rid of all these fingerprints. Have you ever washed your hands? <laughs> now, these are all potential coincidences, of course, but ask yourself, how many connections to the CIA would you have if someone went through your life in excruciating detail like this? I wonder if conspiracy theorists would dig up the guy in my fifth grade class who told me that his dad worked for CSIS, even though I'm pretty sure he was just trying to impress me. Yeah, nice try, buddy, but my dad is actually way cooler than that. He's a teacher. 
sunglasses. Okay, the CIA section is going on longer than I intended, so let's break it up with another conspiracy theory from Dealey Plaza, and then we'll get back to the CIA. JFK head movement. Now, this is another thing connected to the idea that there was a second shooter. So if you watch the Zapruder film, you'll notice that during that final fatal shot, JFK's head moves backwards. That's weird, right? Like, if he was hit in the back of the head from so far away by Oswald, wouldn't you expect his head to move forward? Well, I agree. That is weird, and I got nothing else to say about it. It's weird. More CIA stuff. I actually found a clip of Lee Harvey Oswald talking about the CIA, and it's kind of interesting. When he was interviewed on the radio just a couple months before the assassination, he spoke about his beliefs, he spoke about the Fair Play for Cuba committee, and about his hopes for the island nation. For the most part, at least in this conversation, I'd say Lee comes off as intelligent, informed, reasonable, and articulate. But at one point, he says something a bit strange about the CIA. We could be on much friendlier relations with Cuba had the government of the United States, its government agencies, particularly certain covert undercover agencies like the now defunct CIA. Defunct? Well, its leadership is now defunct. Alan Dulles is now defunct. To be clear, in 1963, the CIA was not defunct. It was very much just doing its thing. So this is a slightly strange thing to say. Oswald's offhanded remark implies that Alan Dulles in some way was the CIA, and it's not completely wrong. Dulles was a part of the CIA since its inception and served as its director from 1953 to 1961, the longest run of any CIA director ever. It's fair to say that his time as director was formative for the agency. The choices he made, the operations he ran, his management style, even after he left, the agency ran in much the same way it did while he was in charge. To the extent the CIA is a reflection of Alan Dulles' values, it might be helpful to learn a bit about the man himself. In short, Alan Dulles, easily one of the biggest pieces of shit to ever put on a suit and have a meeting with the president. And that's saying a lot. Throughout his life, Alan Dulles always acted in accordance with the desires of the very wealthiest people in America, pursuing the interests of capital around the world with zero care to how these actions would affect people further down the pole. As a corporate lawyer with the most powerful corporate law firm in the country, Sullivan and Cromwell, he represented these interests in the courtroom. Then as a spy during World War II, he represented these interests in Europe. He personally acted against direct orders from President FDR not to negotiate with Nazis. Dulles considered communism the real threat to American values and assisted literal Nazis in any way he could, whether by funding them, providing them intel, or after the war, helping them escape to sanctuaries in Latin America, the Middle East, or the United States. As CIA director, Dulles overthrew Iran's brand new democratically elected government and reinstalled their old monarch, the Shah, who had just been overthrown. This act threw millions of lives into turmoil just to get British and American petroleum companies better prices on oil. The Shah continued his reign of imprisoning, torturing, and executing his own subjects until he was overthrown a second time in 1979. In a similar exercise, the CIA overthrew democratically elected leader of Guatemala, Jacobo Arbenz, Instead of for oil, this was done for bananas, specifically for the benefit of American megacorp United Fruit, who you might know as Chiquita Banana. United Fruit had been a favorite client of Alan Dulles at his old law firm Sullivan and Cromwell. For the sake of cheap American bananas, the CIA replaced Arbenz with the murderous fascist leader Carlos Castillo Armas, whose regime went on to kill around 200,000 people. Both of these coups were undertaken because the CIA falsely claimed the democratic government was secretly communist, but Alan Dulles did sometimes plot to kill actual socialists like Congo leader Patrice Lumumba, whose death he assigned William Harvey to orchestrate. JFK had been planning to meet with the charismatic Congo leader, and unlike most other U.S. presidents, JFK had even spoken positively about African countries seeking to decolonize. But Lumumba was assassinated just days before JFK was sworn into office. There's a photo of JFK reacting to the news of Lumumba's death. Uh, he looks pissed. Welcome to the White House! We killed your friend. Dulles had even targeted leaders of European countries like Charles de Gaulle in France. Dulles seemed untouchable, truly above the law. Organizations like the CIA are sometimes called a parallel government as they make decisions about global affairs without democratic influence and can sometimes be seen as more powerful than the government we do see. Another term for this that's been getting a lot of play lately would be deep state. President Kennedy had never liked Alan Dulles and had always planned to replace him as leader of the CIA. He was eyeing Richard Bissell, who Kennedy saw as a kinder, more sensitive, more reasonable CIA head. 
Then the Bay of Pigs disaster happened. I've gone over events in more detail in this other CIA video, but there's a bit of a different interpretation to events that comes up again and again when you're researching the Kennedy assassination. Whatever way you look at it, the Bay of Pigs was an embarrassing disaster for the CIA. They were planning to topple Castro's regime, throw some violent dictator up instead, and blah, 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 torture his own citizens, yada, 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 U.S. businesses, the mafia, etc., 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 IMF loans. But due to a variety of fuck-ups, the group of anti-Castro Cuban exiles was beaten with ease by Castro and Che Guevara's army, turning into a massive and public and embarrassing spectacle for everyone involved. Never the way the CIA would prefer things to go. But there's a theory that the failure may have been an on-purpose failure by the CIA. That Dulles wanted the initial invasion to fail because he assumed that JFK would be forced to send in the military. Like, when you cook for your girlfriend, but you purposely burn it so there's an excuse to get takeout. But to Alan Dulles' surprise and anger, his girlfriend JFK didn't settle for Uber Eats. Against the advice of the CIA and his Joint Chiefs of Staff, JFK choked that charcoal down like it was nothing. No military invasion, and JFK took most of the blame for the catastrophe in public. But now, JFK had a reason to get rid of the CIA head. He fired Dulles, his right-hand man, General Charles Cabell, and the man most directly in charge of the operation, Richard Bissell, who JFK had once intended to replace Dulles with. This was an unheard of act of aggression against the CIA, who was used to operating without oversight or consequences. It was also an unheard of act of aggression against Alan Dulles, who, as a spy, had lied to, manipulated, and otherwise betrayed four presidents, but never faced consequences until now. The Bay of Pigs failure hung over Dulles for the rest of his life. In a 1965 discussion with Willie Morris from Harper's Magazine, Dulles called the Bay of Pigs the blackest day of my life. And about the man who had fired him, Dulles growled, that little Kennedy, he thought he was God. Now, when Alan Dulles left the CIA, he was 68 years old, and you might expect he would have just settled into the retired life. But no, Alan Dulles continued working, having meetings at his home office with his loyal CIA contacts as though he'd never left. Agents like James Jesus Angleton and Cord Meyer visited Dulles. Dulles also took a meeting with a Cuban exile named Paulino Sierra Martinez, who had once been a henchman of the deposed Cuban dictator Batista, had current ties to organized crime, and would later be suspected by the Secret Service of plotting to murder JFK. Meanwhile, JFK had gone from wanting to fix the CIA by changing his leadership to wanting to break the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. Now, that is actually the correct attitude to have about the CIA, which is a corporate-backed global terrorist organization. The CIA continued to push JFK on absolutely horrendous ideas for foreign intervention. Ever heard of Operation Northwoods? Now, this was a proposal from the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the CIA in 1962, one year after Dulles was fired from the CIA and one year before Kennedy would be fired from the Texas School Book Depository 6th floor. It was signed off and approved by the Joint Chiefs and the CIA before it came across the President's desk. Here's the elevator pitch. Hold the door. Oh, Mr. President, uh, it's funny meeting you. Listen, I know you're busy, so I'll make this real quick. Basically, me and the CIA and the Joint Chiefs of Staff came up with this amazing idea. Okay, you gotta hear this. So basically, you know how a lot of powerful people in the US corporate world and government really, 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 really want to invade Cuba, you know, but the American people aren't psyched about just invading a small country for no reason? Oh, democracy makes imperialism slightly more difficult. You know this. So what if, to change everyone's mind, what if the CIA killed like, oh, a lot of innocent people in an explosion or something that blew up a plane or blew up John Glenn's first ever human in space spaceship, but we made it look like Cuba did it. Then everyone will be mad at Cuba just like we are and they'll agree to let us invade the place. Come on now, it's win-win, okay? Can't lose, all right? This is it, rip, it up, rip off the bandit. You in? JFK was not in. He rejected this proposal, but documentation exists and was released to the public in 1998, just in time for a bunch of people to run wild with it in the 9-11 uh, conspiracy movement. A lot of what I'm talking about in this video is conjecture and circumstantial evidence, but Operation Northwoods was a real proposal and you can find the declassified documents on the National Security Archive under the name Justification for Military Intervention in Cuba. Look it up! It's fucked! It's official documentation for a false flag attack. They typed up their little idea to fake a 9-11 and sent it up the ladder and it got approved by everybody except the one guy at the top. 
So when somebody shot the guy who vetoed a plan to stage an attack on America, make it look like it was Cuba, and use that as an excuse to invade Cuba, the CIA, through actors like Joannides and others, absolutely tried to make it look like it was Cuba and used it as an excuse to try and invade Cuba. Now, this doesn't mean that the CIA planned JFK's death, of course, but at best, they were perfectly happy to use this happy coincidence to their advantage. When JFK was killed, one of the most obvious suspects I can think of for the Warren Commission to question would have been Alan Dulles. The Warren Commission did ask Dulles one question, would you like to be a part of the Warren Commission? That's right. Alan Dulles was one of the members of the Warren Commission, not a suspect. Maybe my little cartoon at the beginning kind of gave that away. Anyway, he was the only member who didn't have another job, so he was able to attend almost all of the interviews more than any other member, including Justice Warren, who was juggling the commission with his other gig as a Supreme Court judge. Dulles asked a full 31% of the questions, and some members began calling it the Dulles Commission. Years later, when the Church Committee and the House Select Committee on Assassinations looked back on the case, many were shocked at the amount of lies the CIA told them during their investigation. They covered their operations from view as much as they could, and internally considered the Warren Commission an enemy to be manipulated. Of course, this also doesn't mean they killed Kennedy. It would also make a ton of sense for them not to want the world to know about all of their plans to assassinate Castro, among other skullduggery. CIA wasn't finished infiltrating and lying to investigative bodies. The House Select Committee on Assassinations relied on retired CIA agent George Joannides as a neutral party to go between the committee and the CIA, which was predicated on the belief that Joannides was not working for the CIA at the time of the JFK assassination. However, Joannides, as we've talked about a few times now, was very involved. In 1963, he was the head of psychological warfare in Miami, working under David Atlee Phillips and overseeing the anti-Castro group DRE, which Lee Harvey Oswald had joined. Pretty relevant, but this information was not released until 2001, over a decade after Joannides had died. Now, one common argument against the idea of a JFK conspiracy is to point out that there would have been no way to keep people quiet. Somebody would have talked by now, right? Well, turns out that a lot of people at the CIA have openly talked about killing Kennedy, and they've been surprisingly detailed about it. The problem is, everybody at the CIA is an evil liar. Now, those are pretty much the only two job qualifications. If someone at the CIA told me that I had an ass, I would reach behind me to see where it fell off. Uh, you gotta take everything you hear from anyone who's ever worked at the CIA with a grain of salt the size of a thousand suns. But let's throw caution to the wind over here at CIA Gossip Corner. Oh my god. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Major CIA gossip here. You remember Howard Hunt? E. Howard Hunt? That disgraced CIA man who was arrested as one of the Watergate burglars? Well, he died. But on his deathbed, he spilled some major tea over the CIA's involvement in JFK's assassination. So Hunt says that the agency used the code phrase, the big event, to talk about the assassination in Dallas. He named a bunch of names, not including Alan Dulles, but you know he wouldn't say anything bad about his beloved Big Daddy Dulles, no matter what. Anyway, Hunt says he was invited to a meeting with Frank Sturgis, who you know was another one of the Watergate burglars, and David Atlee Phillips, who was, as you know, George Joannidi's boss, and David Morales, who all the agents referred to as El Indio because they're like really racist and stuff. And then later, like after that meeting, but before Hunt was, you know, like dying, like in the 1970s, Morales had too many shots and told his lawyer, we totally took care of that son of a bitch, didn't we? Talking about JFK. And then also, dying Hunt said that Cord Meyer was involved, and Cord Meyer hated JFK, but like, all, for all the usual CIA reasons, but also because JFK was 100% fucking Cord Meyer's wife. Like, that's confirmed. Not gossip. Anyway, I heard that Cord Meyer was meeting with Alan Dulles in the months leading up to the assassination, so like, maybe there's something there. Oh, and Cord Meyer's wife was also assassinated, like shot in the head, and her killer was never caught. But the police said it had to have been a professional job. But then some of her friends caught that CIA poet weirdo, James Jesus Angleton, sneaking into her house to steal her diary. But anyway, so Hunt decided not to join the JFK kill team because the guy in charge of it was David Harvey, who was the CIA's head of assassination. And Hunt was like, uh-uh, no way. Harvey is like such a messy bitch, just drunk off his ass 
all the time. I don't trust him for a job like this. And then apparently Sturgis was like, yeah, he's a messy bitch, but like maybe he's the only bitch messy enough to get the job done. So anyway, you know Marita Lorenz, right? She was supposed to kill Castro, but she fucked him instead. Yeah, that one. Well, she says that when she was a CIA informant, she met with Sturgis at a Miami safe house and they were talking about a way to get weapons into Dallas. And guess who was there? Lee Harvey Oswald. Oh my God. My jaw dropped. Great man theory. Okay, we're almost done. I just have one last thing to say, or you can skip this part, whatever. But I want to comment on the fact that there's a bit of a tendency I've noticed among people who get into the JFK assassination on how they interpret the main players in the story. So we humans, we love our stories. And a part of history as interesting and explosive as this is very easily turned into a kind of fairy tale. The CIA and Alan Dulles become one-dimensional James Cameron bad guys whose sole motivation is to cause the most possible mayhem. JFK becomes a leftist icon, a golden dove of peace who, you know, was mere days away from ending the Cold War. But if you ask me, JFK wasn't actually like that. John F. Kennedy was an incredibly privileged man. JFK had the type of privilege where his father bought him a country. During his campaign, JFK actually ran to the right of Nixon on Cuba. While he was in office, he, the push towards the war in Vietnam continued to escalate. While he was working to improve relations with Castro and Khrushchev, he was completely aware of the plots to kill Castro and further American nuclear power behind the scenes. He never liked Alan Dulles, had plans to replace him with Richard Bissell, who he saw as a more reasonable CIA agent, but Bissell was the main guy behind planning the Bay of Pigs, and he was fired with Alan Dulles. But even after Kennedy swore to break the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter them to the winds, his plan was to hand over the CIA's powers to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who worked to serve the same interests. Despite being raised by a wealthy fascist gangster, Kennedy was a better-than-average U.S. president who seems to have cared a little bit about civil rights, anti-colonial movements in Africa, and took the possibility of nuclear apocalypse somewhat seriously. But in between his regular two-minute hump sessions with various women, he was still a U.S. president and guilty of all manner of war crimes as he pushed back on a few of them. It would have taken a lot more to end the Cold War than whatever milk toast reforms JFK would have done had he lived, in my opinion. And much like the great man theory we get with JFK, there's a tendency toward great evil man theory we get with Alan Dulles. Now, evil is a complicated and undefined thing to call somebody, but if anybody can get the label, Alan Dulles can. But Dulles' evil is a very, very common evil, the desire to serve the interests of the extremely wealthy and capital at the expense of everyone else, which is most people in the world. The CIA didn't become evil because Alan Dulles ran it for so long. Alan Dulles got to run the CIA because he was the exact right type of evil for the job. Lee Harvey Oswald was wrong. The CIA was not defunct without Alan Dulles. They continued doing coups, many even more brutal than the ones Dulles had overseen in Iran and Guatemala. Dulles didn't even live to see the neoliberal era and how that changed the way the CIA fucked up countries in the global south. And by the way, the CIA was not the first American organization to invade, coup, and otherwise overthrow foreign regimes. America as a country was literally founded on taking over other nations. One of the first modern coups was undoubtedly the illegal overthrow of Hawaii in 1893, which put Sanford Dole in place as president, whose family used their power over pineapple production in Hawaii to start Dole Fruit Company. This coup was overseen by the Secretary of State, who just so happened to be Alan Dulles' grandfather, John W. Foster. Had they been born today, Dole and Foster wouldn't be qualified for anything greater than competing in wacky facial hair contests, but at the time, they were key figures in performing the brutal work of imperialism. When John Foster left public office, he invented a brand new type of legal practice where he would lobby on behalf of, quote, corporations seeking favors in Washington and chances to expand abroad, which might as well be the CIA's mission statement. This type of shit is an old, old game. The corporate power elite don't need a CIA. The CIA exists because it's the most effective way they've found to pursue their interests, but make no mistake, if the CIA was cut up into confetti and thrown into a tornado like Kennedy had wanted, there would be a million other ways for powerful people to extract all the wealth they desire from the underdeveloped world. I don't know, I, sorry, I just thought that that was important to say. Also, I'm worried that J. Edgar Hoover comes off like a good guy in this. He also sucked. What does Jill Goblin think?
Okay, I'm going to preface my answer by saying I absolutely do not 100% know what happened. Even the most general question was JFK killed by a lone dipshit or as the result of a conspiracy. I don't know, nobody knows, and anybody who tells you that they do know for sure is being dishonest. My personal opinion on who killed JFK is worth about as much as my personal opinion on who's guilty in a Netflix true crime show, Making a Murderer, which for the record, I think it was that one cop. All right, I kept you waiting long enough, so here it goes. I think that things really start clicking into place once we take another look at JFK's Cuba surrogate, Donovan. Donovan, in lowercase letters upside down, is Uvawop, which is the exact sound made by aliens. So if we take as a given that Donovan was either himself an alien or an alien contact, it logically follows that aliens must have laid eggs inside of JFK the president. It's eerie how much sense everything makes when we realize that alien eggs are always implanted in the brain. So when those eggs hatched, they caused JFK's head to explode in front of everyone. To convince us all that JFK hadn't given birth to the future overlords of humanity out the back of his skull, the Food and Drug Administration concocted the story of Lee Harvey Oswald, who was actually just a simple Revolutionary War era ghost summoned by FDA sorcery. From there, it proceeds exactly as you'd expect. Jack Ruby was a Ghostbuster. Yes, Ghostbusters are real, try and keep up, and he didn't shoot Oswald with a gun, but actually sucked him up with a ghost vacuum disguised as a gun. Also, Cuba doesn't exist. It's a collective delusion most countries have fallen prey to that covers up the true location of Atlantis. When you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Just kidding. I don't believe most of that. Of all the conspiracy theories, I think the idea that the CIA killed JFK and covered it up with the help of the mafia is the most credible. But overall, I think I'm slightly more convinced by the lone dipshit theory. I can't put my gut feeling exactly into words, but here are some of the reasons I feel this way. First of all, I don't see any convincing evidence for a second shooter, and if you thought the magic bullet theory was weird, the bullet wounds make even less sense if we imagine somebody shooting JFK from the grassy knoll on his right. Which leaves us with just Lee Harvey Oswald, and I don't think a guy like that will be depended on by the CIA for such a precise operation. Then there's Jack Ruby, who seems even less reliable. In the end, the most likely explanation to me is that Oswald was a weird guy who got off a couple of lucky shots. The CIA definitely hated JFK, and they definitely tried their best to turn the assassination into an excuse to invade Cuba, and they definitely teamed up with the Mafia on a bunch of stuff, and they absolutely worked to cover up all of their shadowy dealings in the face of the Warren Commission. But I just don't think that they had the coordination and competence to pull something like that off. I think when we see an event as nationally traumatizing as the murder of a president followed by the shooter being killed on live TV, it doesn't make sense to us that such a massive event could be caused by a couple of random dipshits. It's gotta be the CIA or somebody. As Jackie Kennedy said about her husband, he didn't even have the satisfaction of being killed for civil rights. It had to be some silly little communist. The thing is, though, if I did receive 100% proof that Alan Dulles and the CIA definitely killed President Kennedy, that news actually wouldn't change my opinion of the CIA at all. I already think of the CIA as an incredibly well-funded ideological terrorist organization that has been directly responsible for the deaths of millions of innocent people around the world. If the CIA did kill JFK, that literally wouldn't make a list of the top 50 most despicable things they've ever done. I absolutely encourage people to look into the JFK assassination. Read uh, Devil's Chessboard, read JFK and the Unspeakable. Since the CIA is one of the main suspects, you'll end up looking into their shit, and that is an excellent way to realize that the CIA, and by extension, the US government as a whole, actually do not have the world's best interests at heart. Reading about the CIA is actually what moved me from being a liberal to a leftist, and I encourage everyone to do the same. More people realizing that the CIA is bad is unambiguously good for everyone. Now, we wouldn't even know about things like Operation Northwoods without the JFK Records Act, which only came about because of public pressure on the American government to look into the CIA a little bit, which came from the public reaction to Oliver Stone's film JFK, which was only made because JFK conspiracists kept looking into things and finding suspicious CIA stuff. Even if I personally believed 100% that Oswald was a lone dipshit, 
I would still encourage people to look into the assassination, to pressure the government for more transparency, and above all, to research the CIA until you completely distrust them. It won't take a lot of research. Like, imagine you've got three suspects in a shoplifting, okay? And two of them are just random dudes, and one of them is Hitler. So you start digging into their background, right? And you're like, hmm, who could it be? All right, so the first guy here, you know, he's got some unpaid parking tickets. That's not a good sign. The second guy's got overdue library books, which, in my opinion, says a lot about his character. Now, how about this third guy, this Adolf Hitler? What does his record say? Oh, he's got a Wikipedia page. Yeah, check that out. Wait a minute. No, no, scroll up, scroll up. Six million? Dude, this guy definitely stole that pack of gum. So, absolutely. If the JFK assassination is interesting to you, there is so much you can read about it. Spoiler alert, you aren't ever going to know for sure who the culprit or culprits were. But it's fun getting to that point. I won't deny it. And when you're ready to get into stuff that's less conspiracy theory and more conspiracy fact, I recommend the Jakarta Method. As it turns out, we don't actually need to speculate at all in order to understand the horror of the CIA and U.S. foreign policy in general. You don't need to believe JFK was killed by the government. His brother RFK, on the other hand... Here we go again!